Hello, boys and girls. Mrs. Pecora back to read you another chapter of Prince Pugly of Spud in the Kingdom of Spiff by Robert Paul Weston. So in the last chapter, we found that the king of Spud decided to run off and become a barber. So the people of Spud decided to go find themselves a new prince, and they found Pugly along with his old granny. So let's read and see what happens next in our novel. Oops, sorry, boys and girls. Wait a minute here. Chapter three. Please, not my Proust. One kingdom over in the kingdom of Spiff, on the glittering ridge of that Spiffian cliff, King Dandy von Fop, that snob of a man, still pestered his daughter, the princess called Fran. Pajamas, he muttered, with boats, he exclaimed. How can you bear it? Aren't you ashamed? The king was still at it, I'm afraid it was true, still spewing his usual hubaloo. Francesca, however, didn't want to be sleek. She refused to be snazzy or trendy or chic. She wasn't concerned with the latest of looks. What concerned her, as always, were only her books. Oh, Daddy, she said, you know that's not me. You can bark all you want, but you've got the wrong tree. Don't try to tell me to wear something new. I won't be convinced, not even by you. So quit it, okay? I won't be induced. I simply would rather be reading my Proust. King Dandy, however, was set in his ways. Franny, he grumbled, your head's in a haze. How is it you're always so far out of touch? I mean, really, Francesca, this is too much. Our centenary ball is less than a week. Our people will think that I'm raising a freak. They call you a dimwit, a fashion buffoon. They'll say that you're crazy as mad as a loon. But wait, it gets worse and let me be clear. Do you know who is coming? Do you know who'll be here? Miss Ruby LaRue of Ruby Boutique. The ultimate maven of spiffy and chic. When he uttered the name, even Franny grew still. She shivered. She felt a disquieting chill. Miss LaRue was a legend, the cream of the crop. Her boutique was the kingdom's most popular shop. Everywhere that you went, you would notice her face in commercials on billboards, billboards all over the place, simpering down with her powdery mug, looking larger than life and exceedingly smug. I don't care, said the princess. Let her come if she wants with her fashion advice, or should I say taunts, because that's what they are. Let's be honest for once. That woman's no more than a snobby old dunce. Shh, hissed the king. What has somebody heard? You can't really mean that. Please don't be absurd. He stomped with his foot in his elegant shoe. We're talking right now about Ruby LaRue. In a matter of days, she will come as our guest, but you're wearing pajamas. Oh, she won't be impressed. So please, would you find something decent to wear? If Miss Ruby sees those, she'll have puppies, I swear. He was just getting ready to say something more when a butler arrived to darken the door. As perhaps you'd expect, he was dapperly dressed with a bow tie and tails and an elegant vest. Your Highness, a message, the butler intoned. He didn't quite speak, but rather he droned. With him, he carried a del delicate tray. It was silver, upon which an envelope lay. What's this? asked King Dandy. Where is it from? Tell me. Who sent it? From whence has it come? Perhaps more importantly, what are those dots? It was true. The paper was speckled with spots. Leaning over the tray to examine it close, King Dandy exclaimed, how insufferably gross. The papers be smirched with a sprinkling of crud. Can it be? Is this envelope spotted with m m mud? King Dandy, you see, was frightened of dirt. If a smidgen of dust were to fall on his shirt, he would scream like a child. At times he would faint. If not, he would certainly voice a complaint. It's from Spud, said the butler with a roll of his eyes and a look of disdain that he couldn't disguise. The Spud? said the king. How unspeakably rank. Of course we have only those dullards to thank. With their kingdom of muck, their kingdom of sludge, the whole of their land is one icky brown smudge. The butler agreed. He nodded his head. Your highness, you're right. They're awful, he said. 
but you've nothing to fear. Here's what I shall do. I will open this message and read it to you. He picked up the paper as if it were cursed, as if it were moldy and ready to burst. He unfolded the flap and extracted the note. Very well, then, he gulped. It reads, and I quote... To our dearest fellow queens, to our dearest fellow kings, we are planning one of our extra special gatherings. Why, you ask? We're sad to say, because our king has run away. When he vanished, oh, despair. Yes, it's true, we thought it stunk. Why, oh, why, that's what we thunk. We assumed he must be drunk. Perhaps we hoped a brief sojourn. Nope, the dope did not return. But that's okay, we do not mind, who said we ever want him back. In fact, we think that if he tried, we would give him such a smack. So yes, he's gone, our king has fled, but now we have a prince instead. His name is Pugly, he's a catch, he's nothing like that other guy. So come and meet him here in Spud. Oh, but hurry, here is why, his coronation happens soon. In fact, it's right this afternoon. When the butler had finished, he turned up his nose. It's atrocious, he muttered, as poetry goes. It started out bad, went straight on to worse, a dismal example of doggerel verse. You're right, said the king. I quite see your point. The rhythm, the rhyme, it's all out of joint. But it came from the spuds, and as everyone knows, their poems are nearly as bad as their clothes. Yet sadly, he muttered while wringing his hand, it's the law that the leader of each of the lands must attend a new crowning and show I shall go, but the spuds, they make me so queasy, you know. Indeed, he was green, he looked suddenly sick, his pallor went pasty, his forehead was slick. He bent at the waist, his hands on his knees, so the butler came over to put him at ease. There, there, said the servant. I'm sure you'll be fine, but those spuds, I agree, they're no better than swine. That clothing they wear, oh, it's all out of whack. Now here, let me help you by rubbing your back. But the butler's massage wasn't very much help. The king made a pitter, pitiful, whimpering yelp, and then with his head hanging down to the south, he puked just a little bit into his mouth. Meanwhile, Francesca, to a certain degree, was intrigued. She looked up inquisitively. Pugly, she said, and she savored the word. It's like no other name that I've heard. She turned to the butner, butler with a questioning glance. This Pugly, she said, is he bookish, perchance? The butler just shrugged and clearing his throat said, All I know is what's here in this note. In response, Freddy nodded. She was thinking, you see. I wonder, she said, is this Pugly like me? Perhaps he likes books in similar way. Perhaps I should go to his crowning today. Her father, however, set his hands on his hips. His expression was sour. He was pursing his lips. Francesca, he said, his demeanor severe. Unless you change clothes, you're staying right here. But dad, Freddy said, that just isn't fair. I love my pajamas. What else would I wear? Well, said the king, how about something nice, something regal for once, if you want my advice, something that wasn't just sewn out of scraps, something befitting a princess, perhaps. Oh, daddy, said Franny, pajamas are fine. They're simple and fluffy and rather benign. Besides, it's a fact that a person succeeds not by her clothing, but rather her deeds. Deeds, cried the king. Oh, don't be so soft. All deeds do is make you all sweaty, he scoffed. No, no, I would argue, or rather insist, that fashion's the reason that people exist. Francesca said nothing. Her only reply was to open her book with a shrug and a sigh. But the sound of the crinkle that came from the page made her snob of her father fly into a rage. He glared at his daughter. Francesca, he roared. I'm your father, the king. I will not be ignored. To you, it may seem like I'm making a fuss, but it's clear to me now your problem is thus. Reading all of those books has made you insane. It has poisoned your spirit and addled your brain. You no longer see clothes in their natural rule when in fact they're the core of the Spithlian soul. Instead, you read stories of lurid appeal featuring people who aren't even real. From now on, however... There'll be no more pretend. Your reading, my dear, has come to an end. 
he ordered his butlers, his soldiers, his staff to remove every book on his kingship's behalf. He decreed in a voice that was solemn and slow, you must lock every book in the dungeon below. Franny watched as they cleared every shelf, every nook, and proceeded to lock away every last book. Her Dickens, her Bronte, her Austin, her Poe. As her father decreed, they all had to go. Her poetry, too, her Rossetti, her Pound. They vanished, it seemed they would never be found. The princess, of course, was profoundly distraught. Please not my Proust. She, he's my favorite, she thought. But they took every volume, all oh, seven, in fact. So shocked was the princess, she could hardly react. Her eyes filled with tears as she started to pour. She could not stop a sniffle from snuffling out. When the king saw his daughter so clearly upset, he felt for a moment a pang of regret. I'm sorry, he told her. Try not to be mad. It's merely my duty as a spiffy and dad. There's no need to cry as I imagined you would. Believe me, Francesca, it's for your own good. No more novels and poems and all of the rest. For once you'll stop reading, you'll get up and get dressed. He turned to his butler, who was there to obey, in his usual cringing, obsequious way. Go and fetch, said the king, my galoshes and coat and a silk that might cover my mouth and my throat. And be certain the fabric is deeply perfumed. If I breathe in that spudly and air, I'll be doomed. So be sure to use lots. I'll need all of it since I am headed for spud to meet the new prince. Then King Dandy von Fopp, with a quivering heart, plugged his nose with his fingers and turned to depart. Meanwhile, Francesca felt lower than low. She had nothing to read and nowhere to go. What an absolute bummer, she sobbed to herself. There's nothing but shadows on every last shelf. Lying back on her pillows in utter despair, her head in a haphazard halo of hair, her eyes full of tears and her nose full of snot, she found there was something her father forgot. Under her pillow, one book had been missed, a single old copy of Oliver Twist. All right, boys and girls, stay tuned to read chapter four next. Have a great day.